Today's podcast is sponsored by NetSuite, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy-to-use cloud platform. Over 27,000 businesses already use NetSuite, and right now, through the end of the year, NetSuite is offering a -a one-of-a-kind financing program to those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash gold. Today's podcast is also sponsored by Shopify. Shopify is a platform designed for anyone to sell anywhere, giving entrepreneurs like myself the resources once reserved exclusively for big business. For a free 14-day trial and full access to Shopify's entire suite of features, go to shopify.com slash gold. I want to wish all of my listeners a happy Thanksgiving as we begin the holiday season. U.S. stock market is, of course, closed today to allow Americans to observe the Thanksgiving holiday, which unfortunately for many Americans is going to be the most expensive Thanksgiving ever. Forget about how much it costs to get to your Thanksgiving dinner if you have to travel But just if you look at the cost of the meal alone, even the government admits that prices are up 5% over the past year, making this officially the most expensive Thanksgiving dinner ever. But if you take a look at the data from the American Farm Bureau Federation, which is probably far more accurate because this is a private company that represents the farming industry. So I would imagine that they have a better feel for what's going on on the farms. But according to the American Farm Bureau, the price of Thanksgiving dinner is 14% higher than it was a year ago. And that to me makes a lot more sense with the type of inflation that I think we actually have right now. Because if you look at you know the shadow stats numbers, where they measure consumer prices, not using the CPI that we use today, but using the same CPI they used back in 1980, they get a year-over-year increase in consumer prices of 14%, which makes sense and is more in line with what we're seeing on import-export prices and the estimate that we're getting on the increase of the cost of Thanksgiving dinner. Now, you know, if the farmers weren't so politically popular because no politician wants to beat up on the farmers, right? Everybody wants to be the farmer's friend and get the vote of the farmers. If people didn't like farmers, I'm sure that Joe Biden would have made a speech and he would have blamed the rising cost of Thanksgiving dinner on the farmers. He basically would have said these damn farmers, these lazy farmers, they're just not growing enough food. That is the problem. We have all this demand. Americans are hungry. They want to have Thanksgiving. And those pesky farmers, they just won't get off their butts. They're just lying on the couch and they're not working hard enough. And that's why Thanksgiving dinner is so expensive because these farmers are just not doing their job. And I'm not making this up because that's exactly what Biden said about gas prices and oil companies. Joe Biden blamed rising gas prices on oil companies' failure to ramp up production. He said in a speech that it's the fault of the oil companies that they simply fail to ramp up production fast enough to meet growing demand. Now, first of all, there's so many things wrong with that statement. I mean, number one, Joe Biden claims that he doesn't want more oil production. He wants green energy. There's all sorts of political pressure on oil companies not to produce more oil. Isn't that the whole premise of the Green New Deal? We don't want all these fossil fuels. Now you have Joe Biden complaining that we're not getting enough production of fossil fuels, that these oil companies are not polluting the environment more by creating more oil and gas that we don't want. No, all of a sudden, oil prices are up, and now Biden is upset that oil companies aren't producing more oil. Well, that is always going to be the consequence of the Green New Deal. The whole idea that we can move away from fossil fuels towards greener sources of energy, that automatically comes with a price tag. If you are going to advocate for a Green New Deal type program, then you need to level with the American public and tell them that that means 
energy prices are going to be much more expensive. Because if green energy was more efficient than fossil fuels, we would already be using it. I mean, companies are not dumb. They want to maximize their profits. And if they can produce energy cheaper using solar or wind or whatever, that's what they would be doing. The reason that we're using fossil fuels is because the consumer wants cheap energy and that's the cheapest way to provide it. So if Biden and his Green New Deal buddies, if they really want the American public to accept this agenda in order to save the planet from climate change, then they need to level with the public about what it's going to cost, meaning energy is going to be a lot more expensive. But the politicians know if they try to put a price tag on the Green New Deal, voters won't buy it. That's why whenever they present this type of legislation, supposedly it's going to make us all richer. We're all going to benefit. But there is no gain without pain. There has to be some sacrifice. If we're going to save the planet, then we have to give something up in return. And what we have to give up is cheap energy. But you know what? Americans don't want to give up cheap energy, especially for something like saving the planet from climate change when the scientific evidence with respect to climate change and man's role in potentially creating it is so dubious and up for debate. So there isn't a political consensus out there in support of this regulation. That's why they always try to sugarcoat it with false claims of how we're all going to benefit immediately from this booming economy that will be ushered in by this green revolution. But the minute we get a small taste of what would happen, rising prices, all of a sudden, no, 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 we want oil companies to open up the spigots. But of course, the other problem with what Biden is saying is that it's just not true. I mean, forget about the hypocrisy of him wanting, demanding oil companies to produce more when, of course, everything the Biden administration would be doing would undermine the ability and the incentive of oil companies to produce more. In fact, I mentioned in my last podcast Biden is going to sell oil out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Doing that automatically discourages more domestic production. If you're trying to artificially keep the price down, well, then you're going to discourage the type of investment that would be required to get production up. But everything that the Biden administration is doing would discourage the oil and gas industry from making the type of investments that would be necessary to really ramp up production. But of course, it can't be ramped up overnight. It takes time to ramp up production. And so the higher prices we're seeing now are not the result of a failure to crank up production over the last few months. The problems that we're seeing now is because the Federal Reserve has been cranking up the printing presses. And maybe this hasn't occurred to President Biden, but oil companies just can't pump oil as fast as the Fed can print money. In fact, they don't even have to use a printer anymore. They just create the dollars out of thin air on a computer program. And we just can't produce real oil as fast as the Fed can conjure fake money into existence. When he talked about the rising demand, What Biden failed to acknowledge was the source of that rising demand. Why is it that so many people have all this money to buy oil? Well, it's because the Federal Reserve and other central banks have created it. That is the problem. So we have more money to bid up the supply of oil and gas. And so that's why the prices are rising. It's not because the oil companies haven't produced enough. It's because the Fed and other central banks have printed too much. But I want to talk a little bit, not just about the cost of Thanksgiving, but the history of Thanksgiving, because most Americans have no idea what the Thanksgiving holiday even represents. And I think it's a very important lesson that has been lost on so many people. And one of the reasons I'm even thinking about talking about it today is I just did another one of these debates on RT, Russia Television, and I was up against Professor Richard Wolff. And I've appeared with this guy many times on RT. This guy is an economics professor. He's currently affiliated with the University of Massachusetts Amherst, but he's taught at a lot of other colleges and universities, including Yale, right? But the guy is a self-professed Marxist. 
Now, number one, nobody who is a Marxist should be teaching economics to American students. But I have experience with this firsthand. I mean, I remember my freshman year at University of California, Berkeley. I went to Econ 101, and it was an enormous class. It was in a huge theater. There was at least 1,000 students, maybe more, sitting in this gigantic theater for Econ 101. And the teacher started talking, and I really couldn't believe the nonsense that she was saying. I mean, it so infuriated me that I actually showed up at her office later that day to kind of confront her based on the idiocy of what I heard her say. Remember, she is speaking to a freshman class at Berkeley, right? Fresh out of high school, really don't know that much about economics. And this is their first experience with a college level course. And they're about to learn economics, right? And so I went to her office hours and I introduced myself. Hi, I'm Peter Schiff. You know, I'm in your freshman econ 101 class. I just want to ask you a question. I said, are you a communist? I mean, that was the first thing I said because everything she said in Econ 101 to me revealed the fact that she was a communist. And her answer really surprised me. She said, I'm not a communist. I'm a Marxist, right? As if there's even a difference between communism and Marxism. But a lot of the people that claim to be Marxists and not communists, the reason they want to say they're Marxists is because there's a lot of examples of the failures of communism, like the Soviet Union and all the millions and millions of people who have been murdered by communists. And so somehow it cleans it up a little bit if you claim that you are a Marxist and not a communist, even though Karl Marx is the father of communism. And he wrote the book on communism, The Communist Manifesto. I mean, he had help from his buddy, Charles Ingalls, but he wrote that book back in 1848, and that's basically the communist Bible. I mean, so if you say you are a Marxist, you are a communist. And so it's not surprising to me that Richard Wolff, a Marxist, is teaching economics at a U.S. university when I myself was taught economics by a Marxist at a U.S. university. Now, of course, I wasn't actually taught because after I had my office hours with this self-professed Marxist, I dropped the class. I never showed up again. And I didn't take another econ course at Berkeley until I was in the business school and there were some required econ courses. But, you know, I was lucky, right? I knew enough to understand that this professor was a Marxist. But most of the other freshmen at Cal had no idea. And this is why Americans are so screwed up. This is why understanding of economics is so bad because so many young Americans are getting their first introduction to economics filtered through the prism of a Marxist. So it's no wonder so many people are so ignorant when it comes to economics when they're learning economics from a Marxist. This is it, the putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated financial software? To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth. With visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more, NetSuite is everything you need to grow, and it's all in one place. With NetSuite, you can automate your process and close your books in no time while staying well ahead of your competition. 93% of survey businesses increase their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. In fact, over 27,000 businesses already use NetSuite. And right now, through the end of the year, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program to those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash gold. So head to netsuite.com slash gold right now for a special end-of-year financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. That's netsuite.com slash gold. Now, I mentioned Karl Marx wrote that book, The Communist Manifesto, in 1848. But what Marx didn't realize when he wrote his book is that the very premise of his book had already 
been proven not to work. It had already been tried and failed about 200 years before he was born, 400 years ago, at the Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts. Because when the Pilgrims first came to the United States on the Mayflower, they landed in what is now Plymouth, Massachusetts, in Plymouth Colony. They named it after the port, Plymouth Port in England. That's where the Mayflower set sail. And so they named the colony after the port that they set sail from. But when they sailed over here, their initial intent was to create the equivalent of a communist society. It was going to be a communal settlement. The basic tenant was going to be from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Precisely the tenant upon which Karl Marx based his entire thesis, only they came up with the idea 200 years before Marx was born. Their theory was that everybody was going to work collectively, that all of the colonists were going to work on this communal farm. Everything was going to be owned by the community, no private property, right? So everybody was going to come out and farm as best they could, right, from each according to his ability. So all of the settlers were going to go out and work as hard as they each could, and then they were going to contribute everything that they produced, right? Maybe just give it to the equivalent of the settlement government or whoever was in charge, right? They were going to put everything in this one pool, and then it would all be distributed out equally to all the settlers. So no matter how much food you produced, no matter how hard you worked, you would get the exact same portion as people who didn't do any work at all. Of course, everybody was expected to do work, but in reality, nobody did. Because socialism destroys the initiative of people to work. Because if you're not going to bear, if you're not going to reap the rewards of your work, why bother? If you're not going to get any more food than the people who slack off, why not slack off yourself? I mean, all the initiative, all the motivation gets destroyed. And that's exactly what happened. A lot of the settlers just refused to work. Now, of course, they came up with excuses. I'm not feeling well. You know, I'm sick. I'm tired. And of course, those who did work didn't work that hard because why bother? Everybody knew that no matter how hard they worked, they wouldn't get any more. And people resented other people for not working. And so they didn't want to be the sucker who does all the work. And so there was all these incentives. I talk about moral hazard all the time. And there is no more moral hazard than you get with the philosophy from each according to his ability to each according to his need. It doesn't work. Unfortunately, Professor Wolf doesn't understand that, even though the Pilgrims proved it didn't work 400 years ago. Karl Marx didn't understand it, even though the Pilgrims had proved it didn't work 200 years before he was born. Now, as a result of this, I think over the first couple of years, half of the Pilgrims starved to death. And the rest of them would have starved too. The whole colony would have died out. There never would have been a United States of America if the pilgrims hadn't done something that almost no socialist does. And that's learn from and admit their mistakes. Because before the other half of the pilgrims dropped dead from starvation, they realized that socialism doesn't work, that Marxism does not work. That from each according to his ability to each according to his need doesn't work. What does work? Free market capitalism. And the pilgrims themselves proved it. Because what they ended up doing is then they divvied up all the land. And so each individual settler got their own piece of land to farm. And then each settler got to own whatever he produced. He didn't have to share it with everybody else It was their own private property. And what do you know? As soon as everybody began working for themselves and their own family versus everybody else, they all started to work. All the people that were too tired and sick to work suddenly had lots of energy. And they worked and they had a boom in their economy. They had bountiful harvests. 
They had so much. Not only could they trade with each other, but they started trading with the natives, with the Indians, right? You had this economic boom. You had all kinds of prosperity. You had a bountiful harvest, all this food, and that resulted in the first Thanksgiving. And what were the pilgrims thankful for? They were thankful because they were smart enough to abandon a failed economic system that didn't work, socialism, and embrace one that did, capitalism. Before we had capitalism, there were shortages. Once we adopted capitalism, we had massive surpluses. And that's what I've been talking about when you see the politicians trying to blame the problems in the economy on shortages. Strong economies don't produce shortages. They produce abundance. The Plymouth Colony had a big shortage. And they had shortages because there was no production. And they had no production because they had no private property. They had no incentives. They had a Marxist society. And as a result, there were shortages of everything and the pilgrims were starving. When they abandoned Marxism and embraced capitalism, all of a sudden there was lots of food to eat. And so not only weren't the pilgrims starving, they had more than enough and they could have this big Thanksgiving celebration. And what I would encourage everybody to do this Thanksgiving, you know, there's an old tradition, uh, Jewish tradition in Passover. You know, we tell the story of the Exodus where Moses led the people out of bondage in Egypt. That's part of the tradition of the Passover meal. We should have a similar tradition in America for the Thanksgiving meal. Every American, I think, has a duty to explain to his children, the story of Thanksgiving, which is the story of the failure of socialism and the success of capitalism. From an early age, people need to understand that socialism doesn't work. And I don't care how you want to brand it, Marxism, you can't put lipstick on a pig. It is still a pig. And remember, communism slash Marxism is a form of socialism. Like I explained on my last podcast, you have several forms of socialism, one of them being fascism. And for some reason, a lot of the socialists hate fascism, even though fascism is just a different brand of what they believe in. And in fact, as I said on my last podcast, Communism is actually worse than fascism. They're both bad. It's just that communism is even worse, and communism is Marxism. It's just that some of these communists are too embarrassed to admit they're communists, so they try to dress it up like my professor at Berkeley and say they're Marxists, but Marxism and communism are basically the same thing. And the pilgrims prove that however you describe it, it doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. We have all sorts of examples. That's why I said, at least the pilgrims are unique. They were Marxists that learned from their mistakes. Most Marxists never learn from mistakes. They just repeat them endlessly and expect a different result. The classic definition of insanity, because Marxism is the most insane political philosophy. Shopify is more than just the store. It allows you to connect with your customers, helps you drive sales, and manage your day-to-day business. Supercharge your knowledge, your sales, and your success. For a free 14-day trial, go to shopify.com slash gold, all lowercase. Shopify is a platform designed for anyone to sell anywhere, giving you the resources once reserved just for big business. It's all customized for you with a great-looking online store that brings your idea to life and tools to manage and drive sales. In fact, I love how Shopify makes it easy for anyone to successfully run a small business. Shopify powers over 1.7 million entrepreneurs from their first sale to full scale. And every 28 seconds, a small business owner makes their first sale on Shopify. So get started now by building and customizing your online store with no coding or design experience required. Access powerful tools to help you find customers, drive sales, and manage your day-to-day. Gain knowledge and confidence with resources to help you succeed. Plus, with 24-7 support, you're never alone. More than just the store, Shopify grows with you. This is possibility, and it's powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com gold, all lowercase, 
for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Start selling on Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash gold right now. But as long as I'm talking about insanity and crazy ideas, I want to switch gears slightly and talk a little bit about Bitcoin. I mean, first of all, there is now a new Thanksgiving tradition where Bitcoiners get together with their family members and try to convert them into the Bitcoin cult. They're trying to look for new converts and they entice them into crypto with their tales of how much money they've made personally by owning it. And since Bitcoin has had a very good year, Bitcoin has appreciated rather substantially since Thanksgiving 2020. That means all the Bitcoiners are going to have all sorts of stories to tell their friends and relatives as they gather around their Thanksgiving meal about how much wealthier they are thanks to Bitcoin. And it's those tales of wealth that might entice or sucker other people into making the same bet. But I also want to talk about a recent Bitcoin debate that I had. This one was hosted by Kitco, and I was debating a guy named Alex Mashinsky who happens to be a very bright guy. Unfortunately, a lot of bright people have gravitated into crypto. Just like there's you know, probably a lot of bright people who have gravitated to Marxism. It's amazing the foolish things that smart people will sometimes believe. But the reason I wanted to talk about this debate I did with Mashinsky was some of the completely insane things that this guy was saying to justify Bitcoin And not just really to justify Bitcoin, but to encourage people to go out and borrow as much money as possible to buy even more Bitcoin than they can afford. And he was trying to sell this as a ticket to wealth, right? And to me, this highlights the big problem in Bitcoin, the way this stuff is sold to the public. And the reason it's so popular is because so many people think it's their ticket to easy street. It's a lottery ticket that's guaranteed to win and that people are going to get rich if they buy it. And it's not just Bitcoin, but all cryptocurrencies. That is basically the use case. It's not because it's a more efficient medium of exchange or unit of account or store of value. None of that is true. The sole reason that people are buying Bitcoin is because they hear stuff like what Alex Mashinsky was saying and they buy into it. In fact, a lot of people in America today are in desperate economic circumstances, and basically they're willing to gamble on a Hail Mary. They're willing to take a shot that the solution to their problems lies in buying Bitcoin because they really have no other viable way out. And so they're believing in anything. But in addition to saying that gold had no value, in fact, during this debate, Mashinsky said that gold is worthless. First, he said, well, you can make jewelry out of it. You can conduct electricity out of it. But other than that, it's worthless. Well, I mean, once you've acknowledged that you can make jewelry out of it or that you can conduct electricity out of it, you've admitted that it's not worthless because is jewelry worthless? No, jewelry is very valuable. So if there's a element that you can use to make jewelry, then by definition, that particular element has value. And there's certainly a lot of value to the ability to conduct electricity, especially in the manner that gold is able to do it. But again, all these proponents that want to tout Bitcoin always need to diminish gold. And since Bitcoin has no intrinsic value, the way to legitimize it is to say, well, gold has no intrinsic value either. Now, the U.S. dollar doesn't have any intrinsic value. That's another way they try to justify Bitcoin by saying, well, the dollar's got no value, so what's the problem with Bitcoin? And again, that's the economic theory that two wrongs make a right. But if there actually ever was hyperinflation, if the dollar ever did collapse, why would that somehow validate Bitcoin? Because it would prove that Bitcoin could collapse too. Because the dollar has value now only because people believe it has value. Well, that's the same value proposition as Bitcoin. And Bitcoin says, well, Bitcoin can work because the dollar works. Well, if the dollar fails, what does that say about Bitcoin, right? If the dollar can fail, if people can stop believing in the dollar after believing in it for how many decades they believed in it, we went off the gold standard in 1970. So we have 50 years of people believing in a fiat dollar. Well, if people can lose confidence in that, 
We only have a 10-year history of people believing in Bitcoin. So if people can stop believing in the dollar, then why can't they stop believing in Bitcoin? You know, in fact, I was watching on CNBC, which by the way, last night they had an entire hour. The title of the show was Crypto Night in America or something like that. And they just spent the entire hour dedicated to shilling Bitcoin and trying to cram more Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies down the throats of their audience. I mean, obviously making their advertisers very happy, but they have swallowed this thing hook, line and sinker. But I wanted to talk about this interview with Kathy Wood. She was on earlier in the day talking about why she loves these disruptive, innovative tech stocks and why she also loves Bitcoin. And one of the reasons that she loves these tech stocks and is not worried about the high multiples is because according to her, we are on the verge of a historic deflation. She doesn't believe any of the hype about inflation, about a crashing dollar. She thinks the dollar is gonna gain value. She thinks innovation is gonna drive prices lower. So she's not worried about these high multiple stocks being hurt by inflation because she doesn't think there's any inflation on the horizon. In fact, she thinks there's deflation. And so that's how she justifies her bullishness on these stocks. But at the same time, she's a bull on Bitcoin and has all kinds of pie in the sky forecasts for how high it's going to go. But the whole basis for the Bitcoin story is that it's a store of value. It's digital gold. And the reason you need to own it is to protect yourself from inflation. Well, if she doesn't believe there's any inflation, if she believes there's deflation, then why Bitcoin? What is the point of having a hedge against inflation if you think there's no inflation to hedge? You see, that logical inconsistency doesn't bother her. But she did acknowledge it, but then she dismissed it by saying that Bitcoin's gonna succeed anyway, that it doesn't even matter if the very premise upon which it's based is wrong, right? There's no reason to own real gold, let alone digital gold, she still thinks it's going to go up because it's so disruptive. Well, what is it disrupting? Gambling? That's it. It's a better way to gamble maybe than other forms of gambling, but it's certainly not disrupting payments. It's not disrupting money. It's not disrupting anything ultimately other than the lives of the people who have been foolish enough to buy it because they're listening to guys like Mashinsky. But one of the things he was trying to claim And here I think he was really talking his book with respect to a company that he's working with, which specializes in lending on crypto. But he was encouraging people to go out and borrow money to buy Bitcoin. And if they own Bitcoin, to borrow against it and and spend it. Don't sell your Bitcoin, just let it go up in value and just borrow against it because it's tax efficient and it's how the rich get rich. And he was comparing borrowing money against Bitcoin to borrowing money against a house or borrowing money against stocks. And the difference is dramatic. And Mishkinsky did not acknowledge this difference. First of all, yes, a lot of people borrow money to buy a house, but that's very different than borrowing money to buy Bitcoin. Because when you go out and take out a mortgage against your house, it doesn't matter what happens to the value of that house once you take on the mortgage, right? The bank that loans you the money, they're not gonna appraise your house every day. And if the price falls below a certain level, they're not gonna ask you to cough up more money. You're not gonna have to pay down your mortgage debt because your house lost value. As long as you make your payments, you're fine. The bank can't do anything. They can't foreclose. They can't go after other assets. Doesn't matter what the collateral is worth. You make your payments, you're fine. That's not true with Bitcoin. When you borrow against Bitcoin, the collateral is marked to market every day. And if the value of your Bitcoin falls by a certain amount, you need to come up with more money. And if you don't come up with more money, they sell your Bitcoin into the market and you no longer own it. Given the volatile nature of Bitcoin, I mean, even if you are a Bitcoin proponent, you have to acknowledge the volatility. Bitcoin can drop 50, 60, 70, 80% at any moment. So how can an asset that could fall that much and has repeatedly fallen that much 
and everybody will acknowledge that it can fall that much, how can that be the basis for a loan? You can't hodl your Bitcoin if you're on margin because the next time there's a big sell-off, you're going to get forced liquidated. I mean, the whole idea is buy the dip, right? That's what they say, buy the dip. Well, if you're on margin, you're going to be forced to sell the dip. What idiot is going to margin their Bitcoin? Well, apparently there's a lot of them. People are being encouraged to do that. And I think one of the reasons that so many people are being encouraged to margin their Bitcoin is because the whales don't want people selling their Bitcoin because you have a lot of people now, a lot of young people who have all this wealth in Bitcoin yet maybe they still live with their parents and you know they're driving a beat up old car and maybe they want to move out and get their own place and buy a new car, but we don't want them selling their Bitcoin because the price will fall. So let's try to create a way that they don't have to sell their Bitcoin. They can have their cake and eat it too. Well, they'll borrow. We'll let them borrow money against their Bitcoin and that way they don't have to sell. But this is an accident waiting to happen because not only are the borrowers going to lose a lot of money, but ultimately the lenders too. Because when Bitcoin crashes, I think that they're not going to be able to liquidate Bitcoin for enough cash. Because once you hit these margin calls in a very thin market, who knows what's going to happen? The bids may not be there. The exchanges shut down. And by the time these forced sells are liquidated, I don't think enough money will be recovered to repay the margin debt. And so the lenders are going to take a loss. Now, maybe the lenders are smart enough to be short Bitcoin. Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe they don't care if the value of the collateral crashes because they've gotten short. I don't know. But to me, it would make no sense to actually lend on such shaky collateral. Now, I know people will say, well, what about stocks? People borrow against their stocks and they can have margin calls. That's true. But stocks are not nearly as volatile as Bitcoin, especially if you have a diversified portfolio. I mean, it's possible for one individual stock to drop by 50%, although usually a drop of that magnitude may take many weeks or many months, you know, whereas with Bitcoin, it can happen in, in hours. So you might have more time uh, to liquidate or get out. But if you have a diversified portfolio where you're long many stocks and then you're on margin, the odds of the entire portfolio making a 50% drop are pretty slim. And of course, if you happen to be long dividend paying stocks, the dividends are going to help you cover the cost of the money you borrowed against those stocks. But you're not getting interest on your Bitcoin, although apparently you are. That was another issue that Mashinsky brought up. He said that now people that have Bitcoin, you can get paid interest, I don't know, with 5 or 10% interest on your Bitcoin, which to me sounds a lot like something Bernie Madoff would be doing because how are you going to pay interest on Bitcoin when the Bitcoin itself doesn't generate any income out of which to pay the interest? Well, obviously what's happening is that you are getting paid interest on your Bitcoin because you are loaning your Bitcoin out. And the interest that you're earning is basically the cost of borrowing the Bitcoin. So somebody is borrowing that Bitcoin. Well, what are they doing with the borrowed Bitcoin in order to pay you interest? Well, they're obviously trading it. Many of them may be trading it from the short side. But what happens if they end up losing the Bitcoin, right? They All trades aren't guaranteed to be successful. What happens if the Bitcoin that you loaned out don't get repaid. And also, if a lot of people are paying high interest to borrow Bitcoin, maybe they're doing it to fund the short position. It could be that there's a pretty big short position being built up in Bitcoin. And you know when these shorts are going to cover? When all the leverage longs, all the people who have borrowed money against their Bitcoin, when they're forced liquidated during the next collapse, that may be when the people who are borrowing your Bitcoin and paying you interest are going to be covering their shorts. And by the way, this guy Mashinsky had the nerve to state that there was no more leverage in Bitcoin, that the decline from, what, 68, 69,000 down 
to 62 or 63,000, whatever the bottom was of the recent decline. According to Mashinsky, that shook out all the leverage, that all the retailers, all their individual holders who had borrowed, that all that margin debt is now gone because we've had this tiny correction in the price of Bitcoin, which I did not believe for a minute. There's no way that the margin has been purged from the system with such a small decline. But that is the type of stuff that you have to say to shill Bitcoin. So if you want to see this debate, it's up on the internet, Peter Schiff, Alex Mashinsky. And you know, this is the first time in one of these Bitcoin debates, I actually lost my temper. I mean, I actually lost my cool and really started yelling a little bit at Mashinsky and at the moderator. I mean, it gets very frustrating to me to hear all this nonsense, people just making stuff up and spouting it out even more so than when I have to listen to Richard Wolf. I mean, I actually think Richard Wolf is a nice guy. You know, he's just misinformed. And he and I actually agree on a lot of the problems, which is the same thing with the Bitcoiners. A lot of people who I end up debating Bitcoin, we agree on a lot of the problems. It's just that with the Bitcoin people, we disagree on the solution because their solution is always Bitcoin. And I just think that makes the problem worse. But with a guy like Professor Wolf, we disagree on the cause as well as the solution. With the Bitcoiners, at least we all seem to agree the problem is government. But Professor Wolf thinks all the problems are capitalism. He thinks everything that we're seeing is created by capitalism. In fact, he claimed in my most recent interview that Joe Biden was a great capitalist because I said he was a socialist. And Wolf said, no, 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 he's a capitalist. He believes in capitalism. No, he doesn't. Everything that he's trying to do is socialist. If Biden believed in capitalism, he would be advocating for less government, not more government. He wouldn't want more government spending and more government programs. He would want less. The fact that he is trying to infuse more socialist programs into what used to be a capitalist economy doesn't make him a capitalist. In fact, when I was criticizing the Federal Reserve, Richard Wolf was like, well, that's capitalism. The Federal Reserve is a capitalist institution. No, it's not. It is a socialist institution. Just because it was adopted in a capitalist country doesn't mean it's capitalist. This is how socialism works. It infects capitalism. It creeps its way in gradually and screws it up. It's like a parasite gradually killing the host. And then what happens is all of the problems that this parasite causes get blamed on the host. There is nothing capitalist about central government planning when it comes to money. In a capitalist society, we have free market money. We have gold and silver. We have real money. We don't have a central bank. In a capitalist society, interest rates are discovered by the market. They're not set by the equivalent of a Politburo, which is what we have at the Federal Reserve, there's nothing that resembles a free market when you have a government organization fixing a price, deciding this is the price of money. This is the quantity of money. How does Professor Wolf think that there's anything free market oriented, capitalist oriented regarding that system? It is socialist, and its failures reflect the failure of socialism, not capitalism. But for some reason, Professor Wolf can never make those connections. Anyway, though, I want to get into some of the economic data that came out on Wednesday because we got a lot of it, kind of a mixed bag. But one thing in particular that we got late in the afternoon was the release of the Federal Open Market Committee's minutes. And these minutes basically revealed that the Fed is more worried about inflation than they've ever appeared to be. In fact, they admitted, I think for the first time, that their growth forecasts, that the risk to that forecast is on the downside, meaning that growth may not be as strong as they think. On the flip side, their inflation forecast, the risk is to the upside. So, Growth may end up being weaker than they think, and inflation may end up being stronger than they think. In other words, stagflation. This is a very significant risk and represents a real serious problem for the Fed because what does the Fed do if both of these risks come true and growth ends up faltering 
as inflation accelerates. What are they going to do? Now, apparently, the markets think the Fed is going to fight inflation. I don't know why they think that. What is it about the Fed's track record? What is it about the philosophies uh, that they profess that leads anybody to conclude that if the economy weakens and inflation strengthens, that they're going to sacrifice the economy and go and fight inflation? Everything that they have done in the past suggests that that's not going to happen. What the markets should have reacted to as a result of these minutes is they should have sold the dollar and bought gold. Instead, they bought the dollar and sold gold. Gold continued to drift lower and the dollar higher based on what was perceived to be these hawkish minutes because the Fed is now acknowledging the risk of inflation and that inflation may pick up. And you've just had Powell and Brainerd and Biden all talk about how important it is to bring inflation under control. And the markets now actually believe that that is something the Fed is going to do. There's no way the Fed is going to do that. Yes, Biden has to talk about bringing inflation under control because inflation is now a problem for the Democrats. It's going to be a problem at the midterms. The Republicans have hung inflation around their necks like an albatross. And look, I'm happy to have Republicans blaming the Democrats for inflation. I mean, I think it's a good campaign strategy, but again, it frustrates me because in many cases, it's pure hypocrisy because a lot of the Republicans who are blaming the inflation on the Biden deficits and the Biden spending supported the same type of deficit spending under Trump, and they've supported it under Bush as well. The Republicans really have no right to criticize the Democrats for deficit spending when they've done the same thing themselves. And the Republicans had a great opportunity to do something about it when Donald Trump was president and the Republicans had both the House and the Senate. But not only did they squander that opportunity, they took advantage of their control of government to increase spending even more. They voted for more welfare spending. They voted for more warfare spending. And then they reduced taxes. And so they made even bigger deficits. And Trump himself bashed the Federal Reserve into monetizing it all. The minute the Fed tried to raise interest rates, Trump was all over Powell for being public enemy number one and demanding negative rates and more QE. Where were the Republicans back then who were criticizing the inflationary policies of the Biden administration, why were they not criticizing the inflationary policies of the Trump administration? In fact, many of them voted for those policies, supported those policies. So this is the problem with politics and and hypocrisy. And you really don't have much of a foundation to stand on. You're claiming that these Biden deficits are the reason we have inflation, yet you had nothing negative to say about the Trump deficits or their impact on inflation. And in fact, I think that most of what we're seeing now isn't even the result of the Biden deficits. It's more the result of the Trump deficits because inflation operates with a lag. So you print all the money, the impact on prices may not happen for several years. So I think ultimately we're going to get the impact of the Biden inflation on consumer prices. It's just that we haven't felt it yet. It's coming. Now, yes, what we are experiencing now has been exacerbated by COVID. And I warned as much. I was one of the only people when the economy was locking down and everybody was talking about deflation and how COVID was deflationary. I was one of the only people saying, no, this is massive inflation. People are staying at home. We're not producing goods. And the governments are showering the world with money. Had the governments done the right thing, yes, it would have been deflationary. Had governments cut spending and shrunk the money supply, which was what I was advocating, then we wouldn't be experiencing this. But of course, they didn't do that. They created massive inflation, and I was one of the few people that was warning about it. But again, this is not some one-off transitory event. We are witnessing the tip of an inflation iceberg. There's a lot more beneath the surface. And the contributions 
that the Biden administration is making to worsen this are yet to come. And of course, a lot of the new spending programs haven't even been passed yet. I mean, the ink is barely dry on the infrastructure bill, so it's hard to blame the inflation we have now on this infrastructure bill. We can blame the inflation that we're going to have later on that bill, and it's going to be much worse than the inflation we have now. But what we're experiencing now is the delayed consequences of inflation that was created under Trump and under Obama and under Bush. You know, yes, nobody had a problem with all this inflation when it was mainly showing up in the stock market. But now that it's showing up in the supermarket, people have a lot of problems. But the fact that it's in the supermarket was inevitable because that's where all inflations ultimately end up. Doesn't matter where they start, they can start in financial assets, but they always end up in consumer goods. But I want to go to the other economic data that came out earlier in the day on Wednesday. First, we got the durable goods order numbers for October. The estimate was for a gain of 0.3, and that would have followed a minus 0.4 in September. Instead, we end up with another negative print, minus 0.5. So a pretty big miss there, although X transportation we were up 0.5. That was in line, and they upwardly revised the prior month from up 0.4 to up 0.7. And core capital goods came out again in line, up 0.6, and we upwardly revised the prior month from up 0.8 to up 1.3. So kind of a mixed bag on durable goods. The trade deficit for a change, this is in goods, was not a new all-time record. Although the all-time record high from the prior month is now even higher than we were originally told. The September deficit, which was a record, was $96.3 billion. That was upperly revised to $97 billion. So that's the new record. I'm sure we will break it. It won't be long before we print a $100 billion number. But the October number actually dropped all the way down to 82.9. And that was well below the low end of the estimate. In fact, the consensus for the deficit was $94.6 billion. So way below. And the reason that we were so far below was a surge in exports. Exports, which were down 4.7% in the prior month, actually surged by 10.7% in October. Not really sure how we were able to export so much stuff in October, but somehow we did, and that's what narrowed the gap. Imports were only up a half a percent month over month, so that also helped to narrow the gap because we had this huge surge in our exports and not that big a gain in our imports. We'll see if this number ends up being revised upward, meaning a bigger deficit, because maybe there's something wrong because we don't normally have that big a jump in exports. But maybe for some reason, a lot of our exports got crammed into that one month. One of the big shockers, though, was the jobless claims number, the weekly unemployment numbers. We get these every Thursday, but because the market is closed today for Thanksgiving, we got these numbers on Wednesday instead. And the prior week was 268,000, was revised up to 270. The consensus for the current week was for 264,000 new claims. Instead, new claims crashed all the way down to 199,000. That's the lowest we've been in a long time. That's 71,000 fewer than the week before. The four-week moving average now all the way down to 252.25. That is the lowest we've been certainly post-COVID. And it does make it harder for the Fed to justify its emergency 0% interest rate policy and continuing quantitative easing. I mean, how do you even argue for a taper? We need to go cold turkey. We need to start raising rates right now. It's amazing to me that the Fed can continue to follow this dovish script. This inflation is transitory, yet the markets are somehow believing that the Fed is fighting inflation. In fact, the reappointment of Jerome Powell, the markets are treating that as if the Fed has actually tightened policy, right? Somehow, this is the equivalent of a rate hike, reappointing the exact same guy who's been there the whole time and who hasn't changed his tune one note 
suddenly, you know, we've got this inflation fighter and the markets are now starting to price that in. Although, if we really were going to get a Fed fighting inflation, the stock market should be tanking. It shouldn't just be some of these high multiple tech stocks. Yeah, they should be going down the most, but the entire market should be going down because every stock, even those that are value stocks, are overpriced in this market because everything is priced off as 0% interest rates. So all stock prices are artificially high. They're a reflection of these artificially low interest rates. Well, the minute the Fed starts to raise rates, it's going to bring down stock prices. And so if you really believe what the currency traders seem to believe, or the gold traders seem to believe, then stocks need to go down. The fact that they're not is more a reflection of the insanity that's going on in the current market. But while the weekly jobless claims were a sign, I guess, of strength, because not as many Americans are losing their jobs, the new home sales numbers were definitely a sign of weakness. And this is another reason why the Fed doesn't want to raise rates, doesn't want to stop quantitative easing, is because the Fed wants to keep the home market propped up for a number of reasons. One, there are a lot of jobs associated with housing, but housing provides a wealth effect. When homeowners think their house is very valuable, they're more likely to spend money. In fact, the house is better collateral for a loan. People can then borrow money against their homes and spend it. The Fed is very cognizant of the fact that a lot of the spending in the economy is a function of debt. But in order to have debt, you need collateral, and that collateral is the housing stock. And so these new home sale numbers don't bode well for housing prices because new home sales collapsed in October. In fact, there was a big downwardly revision to the September number. That was originally reported at 800,000, and that was revised down to 742,000. The consensus forecast for October was 790,000. That came in at 745,000. So two weak numbers, at least much weaker than had been expected. And what is the reason? Why are new home sales falling? Because consumers can't afford to pay the higher prices. And if they can't afford to pay the higher prices now, given record low mortgage rates or near record low, I think they've come up slightly. But if people can't afford to buy homes today, how are they going to afford to buy them tomorrow if the Fed starts raising rates? The only way they'll be able to afford it is if we get a big drop in home prices. But that opens up a whole new can of worms that the Fed would rather keep closed because we already know what happens when real estate prices drop. People who borrowed money stop paying. And then the banks that loaned the money, now they're in trouble and now there's a bailout. Well, you can't fight inflation and bail out the housing market at the same time. You got to pick your poison. And it's obvious to me which poison the Fed is going to pick. The question is, when are the foreign exchange traders, when are the gold traders going to figure that out. Also, we got the personal income and spending numbers. These numbers were actually stronger than expected. Last month, there was a 1% drop in personal income, and the consensus was for a 0.2% rise. Instead, we had a 0.5%, so more than double the estimates. Also, personal consumption rose more than forecast. That was supposed to go up by 1%. It went up by 1.3%. But if incomes went up by 0.5, but spending went up by 1.3, where'd the money come from? Obviously, debt and depletion of savings. So the money that everybody was holding on to, all that stimulus money, is rapidly being spent as Americans are depleting their savings and borrowing more money in order to keep on spending. Also, there were some inflation numbers embedded in the release. Look at the PCE. These are the numbers the Fed really claims to like. Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, more so than the CPI. So this was up 0.6% on the month, and that followed an upwardly revised 0.4 for September. So the year-over-year increase in the PCE is now 5%. That's much bigger than the 4.4% year-over-year increase the prior month, 5%. The Fed is telling us that this is the measure that it likes to look at 
and it's up 5%. More than double its 2% target. We're not just slightly above 2%. We are miles above 2%. Now, if you look at the core PCE, which apparently the Fed likes even more because it excludes food and energy, that was up 0.4% on the month. Uh, That followed the 0.2% gain. But look at the year-over-year core PCE, right? It doesn't get any better than this, according to the Fed. This is the number that the Fed claims carries the most weight. And of course, it's the one that generally makes inflation look the lowest. That's why the Fed likes it. They like whatever measure sugarcoats inflation the most. But there's no way to sugarcoat this because the year-over-year increase in core CPI is 4.1%. It was 3.6% last month, which they revised up to 3.7. 4.1. How can you justify current monetary policy? 0% interest rates continuing to do quantitative easing when your favorite measure of inflation, year over year core PCE, is at 4.1%. Double your official target. And how can you claim that consumers expect inflation to go back down to 2% when all of the surveys show that they don't. We got the consumer sentiment numbers again out yesterday. Final revision to November sentiment. They actually ticked up a little bit from 66.8 to 67.4. So not quite as gloomy as we were told last time, but still pretty gloomy. And the reason that consumers are in such a bad mood is because inflation is so high, not only inflation today, but the inflation that they expect in the future. And yet the Fed is completely ignoring these expectations, even though it once said that expectations were the most important factor and that they were watching them like a hawk because they didn't want to repeat what they claimed were the mistakes of the 1970s. And if consumer expectations were ever unanchored, if they ever drifted above 2%, well, the Fed would take action. Well, anchors away, they're way above 2%, they're way above 4%, and all the Fed does is talk. Yet, for some reason, the markets still believe what they're saying. Anyway, that's it for today's podcast. Again, I want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. And don't forget what I said earlier in today's podcast. Tell the true story of Thanksgiving so we all can be thankful for capitalism and thankful that the early American settlers, unlike modern Marxists, were smart enough to recognize their mistakes and the failures of socialism and quickly abandoned them to the benefit of themselves and their posterity. (music) 